This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Simon Phipps and I talk with Hart Montgomery of the Hyperledger Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, about distributed data and decentralized trust. But we go much farther than that into wallets, into what the real role of the Hyperledger Foundation is, how it's changed over the years, what all their different projects are, because there are many that involve self-sovereign identity, lots of other topics, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 704, recorded Wednesday, October 26th, 2022. Distributed data, decentralized trust. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Hey there, everybody. I'm Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. And this week, I am joined by Simon Phipps himself, coming in as he will on screen for those graced with visuals. There he is. There I am. Lair. His lair I'm down here in, in the bunker South- in Southampton. <laughs> in the bunker. <laughs> I'm in yep. my bunker. I'm in, a, I'm in a basement here for the next several months right. off and on. I'll be in yep. Hawaii it's, one Witness time. protection is this? <laughs> that, that would be cool uh, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, w- one of my sons is working at a place where um, his coworkers who know he's very smart but don't know why he's working there asked him if he was in witness protection. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Uh, but no, I, um, I'm here. This is Bloomington, Indiana, and we just uh, got a house. So by the end of the oh, year, we'll be over there. Yeah, and my wife is over there fixing things up. Just came in and said, "Do you know the tiles in the bathroom are plastic and not real?" I said, no, I didn't know that. But <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, well, you, you know what you need in that new house is a lovely fresh blockchain. <laughs> there, there's a. Um, it, it may turn out to be a kind of a ball and a block at the end of a chain. I don't know. It was built in 1900, which is rather young by your standards in the UK, but um, quite old here. So um, it's a, but it's it's a cool house, nice, charming old house. So so our our our, our guest today is Hart Montgomery of of the Hyperledger Foundation and uh, crypto and blockchain expert. You're not a blockchain fan. <laughs> uh, that's not why. That's not why I invited you to co-host. But I, I, I'm uh, gathering that. Uh, you, you, you know, um, I, I when I first saw it, I thought it was really cool, and uh, as time has gone on, it has looked more and more to me like slideware from a technology evangelist at a big corporation, and all the applications I've seen for it appear to be um, um, uh, um, uh, the, the almost criminal, if not actually criminal. And so I'm I'm still looking for an example of some reason why it needs to exist that isn't about letting um, uh, big corporate evangelists uh, have conferences in exotic locations. So I, I think that's going to be my, uh, you know, the, the big the big question that I've oh. got to ask today. So you know, wh- is there is <laughs> there any reason a, for this to exist? Other than yet? that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I, I'm sure well, Hart is uh, is is all ready for those questions. Well, let's, I well, well, Bri- well, let's, warned him. Well, let's let's bring it in. First, I did a little a little a little bio here. Um, uh, Hart's the CEO, CTO, sorry, of get through that middle letter right of the Hyperledger Foundation. Extensive experience in blockchain and cryptography. Previously worked in blockchain and cryptography research at Fujitsu Research, where he helped lead Fujitsu's efforts to develop and deploy te- Hyperledger tech. Um, prior to that, he uh, got his PhD in cryptography at Stanford under uh, Dan Bona. I hope I pronounced that right, where uh, he was a Stanford graduate fellow. Um, and he's had numerous academic publications and patents in cryptography and blockchain and brings a wealth of experience and the rest of that. And hi, Hart. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks <laughs> Maybe for we can start me. out by, by just having you address um, Simon's concerns because there they are. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so Simon, 
I like to take a pretty abstract view of blockchain. So, you know, when you ask people like what blockchain is or, or how do you define a blockchain, uh, you get a lot of different answers. Um, but I like to think of a blockchain as a distributed database with decentralized trust. And if you think about, you know, sort of what most blockchain implementations do today, you know, that's really just what they are, right? They're distributed databases with decentralized trust. Um, and if you think about cryptocurrencies, you know, even which I, I gather you're not a fan of, um, you know, sort of like what is Bitcoin, right? Well, it's a distributed database with decentralized trust for, for money, right? If you think about something like Ethereum, um, it's, it's a distributed database with decentralized trust for essentially computer programs, right? I mean, they we call them smart contracts, but they're essentially just turn complete programs. Uh, and, and you, you know, trust is a continuum, right? It's, it's sort of not all or nothing. You know, at one end you have traditional centralized databases, right? And the other, you have systems that are completely, in, at least in theory, uh, if not in practice, decentralized. And you can have some stuff in the middle, right? Like if you run a, a Hyperledger Fabric network uh, with crash fault tolerant consensus, you're sort of somewhere in the middle of, uh, in terms of trust. Um, does that sort of make sense as a as an abstract primitive anyway? Uh, I mean, it does. You know, it's so so blockchain is is a, a distributed linked list as far as I'm concerned, and then it's got layered over the smeared over the top of it some kind kind of a, a trust mechanism to allow people to establish links in the linked list and some kind of voting mechanism in some applications to make sure people can handle uh, clashes between the independent actions of the actors involved. Um, the, the the challenge I have with it is uh, I've yet to see a compelling reason to use this instead of, say, a tuple space. I've yet to see an application that hasn't had to be fixed by having centralized authentication uh, rather than distributed identity. And I've seen quite a few cases where the primary application appears to not be... Um, uh, terribly sound uh, it seems to be like block like bitcoin for example which ultimately is is uh, has caused i would argue more problems than it's ever solved um so the, the 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 challenge is less with the abstract concept which you know i grok and could be called other things other than blockchain it's that that phrase blockchain has attracted to it uh, all of the less reputable part of the internet and they're all having a party there and I think that's really the, uh, the that's really the problem. Yeah, I mean, so I can get into some applications if you like. So some of the cool stuff we've seen, uh, you know, is, is obviously not related to uh, cryptocurrency or, or token speculation or, or anything like that. Uh, one of the first production networks we saw in Hyperledger uh, was called Everledger. Are you, have you, are you familiar with Everledger at all? This was several years ago. I have not seen ago. Everledger, no. Um, so the idea behind Everledger was uh, diamond tracking and tracing. Uh, so if you want to buy a diamond, you presumably do not want to buy a, a blood diamond, right? Uh, and so the idea was using this Everledger chain, uh, you could see the entire provenance of diamond from sort of mine to, you know, to end user, which is, I guess, however you're, you're wearing the diamond and jewelry, um, you could see this in a, in a transparent way, um, and it would allow users to be convinced that they were not buying blood diamonds. And so your natural question when you're talking about, you know, any application where people are using blockchain should be, why do I need decentralization here? You know, why is there not, you know, some central authority that can just manage everything? Uh, and in this case, right, there are lots of industry players that uh, are competitors, right? And, and, you know, they don't want, they don't trust other people to be the, the root of information to sort of maintain everything. Uh, if there were one central authority that, that had vision into, you know, everyone else's activities and, and control the source of information, that wouldn't be acceptable to, to the other players in the industry. Uh, so that was why sort of a, a blockchain was you know, ideal for this case was the decentralization in the industry and the transparency that the end users wanted. Um, right. So, you know, th that I hope that <laughs> at least. Uh, <laughs> well, some, so, you know. so I'm looking at Everledger on screen here. Uh, so, I mean, I wrote an app that sounds a lot like that when I was at IBM in the mm -hmm. 90s. 
um, um, but back before the, the the idea of blockchain had been coined, we 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 created a distributed ledger, and we conceived one uh, uh, then in the two thousands for doing um, transportation ticketing and for doing settlement of transportation ticketing between different transport carriers. Um, uh, and yeah. so I've I've seen applications that use a distributed linked list and a distributed immutable linked list before. The the thing that looking at Everledger. Um, the, the 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 real question here is the degree to which the uh, the trust is independent of the application, um, and the the big problem that that cryptocurrencies have created for us is they've created a world where um, nobody is in control, and so what gradually happens is people do actually take control by taking ever larger stakes in the network, and by taking ever more central convenience positions in the enablement of the platform. And it ends up being centralized, but unregulated. And so the problem that there's been with much of the blockchain that I've seen has been exactly that problem. It has become centralized while without also becoming regulated. And uh, and so that's that's kind of the, the, the place I'm kind of needling into. I can see why I want to use a distributed ledger because I've used one myself commercially in two previous decades. What I can't see is why I want to create uh, a system where uh, there is no trust authority. Why, why would I want to do that? Why would I not want so, to have a consensus trust authority, for example, as my preference? So you're asking basically the the motivating case for why should we use a pub, a fully public blockchain uh, that's ostensibly fully decentralized. Is, is that right? Yes, yeah. I, and, and I've yet to see one, honestly, that isn't in the control of uh, some entity covertly. Uh, be that, uh, like with a lot of crypto, where it's ultimately the control of uh, crypto miners over in, the, uh, over in uh, Central Asia, uh, or where yeah. it's covertly under the control of the technology creators who are the, pe- the only people who truly understand, even though the code is open source, how the technology works. And so they, they own the, the brand name and they tend to centralize the, the control of the technology. That's what I've seen all along. I've seen, I, I really haven't seen any really big public examples of uh, something that wants to own up to being blockchain. And maybe, maybe it is blockchain under the covers and people don't want to call it that because it's disreputable. But I, I have yet to see a really great example of a blockchain that will make me think, oh, then maybe this isn't the dark end of the internet. So I guess then, um, yeah, so, so we use sort of blockchain colloquially to define, you know, public and permission blockchains, right? So, you know, informally, like, you know, we, we sort of use blockchain and, and distributed ledger uh, interchangeably, uh, you know, and obviously a lot of our hyperledger uh, code is focused on, you know, permission blockchains, like Fabric is a permission blockchain, uh, you know, but but we do have, you know, a hyperledger Besu, uh, which is used for both public, it's, it's a public Ethereum execution client, and it's also used for um, some permission blockchains. So, you know, as far as public blockchain centralization goes, you know, uh, th- th- there is a big issue there, right? You know, obviously you mentioned miners. Uh, now you have staking pools. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with yeah. the, the staking pool stuff. Um, so like Lido has a huge percent of, of Ethereum stake uh, locked up on it. And, and you know, ev- everyone's a little worried about this. Um, there's also this issue of MEV and, and block creation now, uh, if you're familiar with that as well, uh, which is another uh, potential uh, censorship and, uh, and centralization issue. Uh, I, I don't know if you've dug into that at all. Uh, yep. but it's, yeah, it's a, a, I mean, I've, I dug in some of those. So, so we, I interviewed Brian, uh, Brian Bailendorf on Floss mm-hmm. Weekly previously twice, actually, about, uh, about oh, wow, Hyperledger. Yeah. Um, and uh, Brian persuaded me uh, in his typical charming and, and intelligent way that uh, Hyperledger is um, th- about taking all the good parts while not doing any of the bad parts of blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, is that true? Is or is is Hyperledger <laughs> actually just an ar- an arms dealer to the bad guys? Well, I think so, but but I mean, Hyperledger is totally open source, right? So we're a Linux Foundation project, um, you know. And I, I define Hyper, you know, Hyperledger has changed 
uh, since the days of Brian. Um, so I define it as, as sort of the, the Linux Foundation's uh, umbrella project for, for blockchain. Um, but we are open source, and so anyone can download the code and, and you know, use it for whatever they want. Uh, <laughs> and we have seen some, uh, some use cases and some uses by some actors that, you know, in, in a vacuum, uh, we would prefer not to have. But, you know, it, it, it's open source. That's just how things work. Um, you know. So, so, so <laughs> to break the pause there, I think, Doc, you're ready with a, uh, with yeah, a, a different um, thought here. Yeah, so, you know, my, um, besides Brian, who's just an old friend, um, my main acquaintance with um, with Hyperledger is, and, and maybe you could go into a little bit of where and how the Linux Foundation comes up with these foundations, uh, sort of foundations within foundations. We've actually had quite a few people on from the Linux Foundation in various ways. Um, uh, when it when it started, um, uh, uh, you know, I came. I my familiarity with it had to do with self sovereign identity and the whole self sovereign identity development movement, and a lot of which is based on blockchains, but some of it wasn't. Most of them did try to say distributed ledger rather than blockchain. Um, and then when a code base was developed, it was adopted by um, uh, by Hyperledger rebranded. So it was open source and under their aegis sort of, uh, in particular, for example, Hyperledger Indie. That was one that came from the Sovereign Foundation, where, full disclosure, my wife was on the board um, at that time. Um, and I'm wondering what's changed since then. I mean, and because I know IBM was heavily involved and it had a thing going on. I don't think IBM is still there anymore, but I'm not really sure. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, IBM is yeah, still there. So okay, so... So what does it what does it look like now? I don't even know what happened to Hyperledger Indy. Is it still there? Is yeah. it still doing stuff? I, oh yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'll go into all of this. So you know, in the beginning, Hyperledger Fabric was the first code base contributed. It was contributed by uh, IBM and Digital Asset, uh, and it still today is to what most people associate with Hyperledger, even though sort of Hyperledger uh, has has grown much larger. Um, since then, you know, we've had a lot more code bases contributed or sort of natively built up in Hyperledger. Uh, I believe we're at 14 projects today. I'll, we just took a new project uh, related to Indie, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you know, we have we have things like Hyperledger Basu, which you know is is an Ethereum execution client uh, that you can run either you know on the Ethereum mainnet or you can run a, a permissions network, so a, a distributed ledger, as, as you all are calling it, uh, on Besu. And we actually have, uh, you know, um, there's a, a group called LAC Chain and that, you know, runs a huge permissioned uh, Besu ledger in South America, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, as, as far as the identity side, you know, it's been really interesting to watch, and that space has grown, you know, tremendously uh, over the past years. It started with Hyperledger Indy. Uh, then Indy has, at this point, uh, forked out multiple projects. So there's Hyperledger Ares, which I don't know if you're familiar with, which yeah. is sort of the agent layer uh, of, of identity. Uh, there's Hyperledger Ursa, which is the, the crypto library. Uh, and then there's also recently uh, an anonymous credential project was approved for uh, this was actually last week, so it's not up on the website yet. Uh, but this was approved for anonymous credentials and, and specifications. Um, you know, so so the identity community is is still going really strong. Um, you know, I think it's a really cool space. It's incredibly decentralized. There are tons of people from all over the world that work on it. Um, you know, one of my favorite facts about the identity community at Hyperledger. Uh, is we have government employees that are full-time maintainers on our identity projects, which I think is really uncommon and really cool. Uh, and th those are some of our most uh, productive maintainers. Um, so, you know, uh, the identity community, so, so back to sort of your, your thing about ledgers. Um, so in the very beginning, uh, you know, Indy was, was an identity-focused ledger. And the idea was that, you know, you have to root your credentials somewhere, right? You have to have a starting point for your, your self-sovereign identity, right? Um, and that 
you know, sort of the root of trust was going to be this this distributed ledger, uh, and this was the reason for like the sovereign foundation and, and everything, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but now, you know, everyone has sort of recognized that you know we should be able to root credentials anywhere. We should, you know, put them wherever you want. You can put them on different ledgers. You can put them on other trusted things besides ledgers. Uh, and and you know so so we've seen a, a real modularization and this is this recent uh, anonymous credential project uh, that came about um, so that you know you you can put your your anonymous credentials on on anything you want and root them anywhere so I'm I'm really excited by that. Mm. I'm I'm just looking at all the names of those projects that are up there. Hart, um, mm -hmm. do you have a concept map that shows? uh what all of those projects do because they've all got um you know the trademark safe names um and yeah uh, so than descriptive names uh, and I, I wonder if you've got an architecture that shows how those all fit in somewhere um yeah so so usually on the website we have them into sort of three categories uh distributed ledgers uh you know um but Unfortunately, I don't think we have uh, a proper DAG, uh, a, a DAG, a, a graph basically showing all of the connections and interdependencies. Um, it's 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 a great question. Um, I can go through some of them if you want. Some of the complications yeah. in this are, are, are projects like Hyperledger Cactus or Cacti, uh, which is our uh, our integration project. So, you know, a lot of people have. Uh, have applications where they want to connect sort of one blockchain or one distributed ledger to another, right? Um, and this is sort sort of the root of this is uh, is something that's been called the blockchain trilemma. If you're familiar with this, have you all heard this? I'll carry on. No, okay. I, I haven't actually. So, it's an interesting. So, one. Even if we uh, have, even if we have all those other people out there, haven't. So. Gotcha. Well, um, so the, the basic idea behind the blockchain trilemma, and I believe it was first coined by Vitalik Buterin, but I'm not entirely sure, uh, was basically that it's impossible to have in a single distributed ledger uh, security, uh, scalability, and decentralization. You have to sort of give up on at least one of these. Now, we certainly hope people don't give up on security because that would be a disaster. So what this becomes is a trade-off between decentralization and scalability. So sort of the more decentralized you are, the worse you scale, right? Um, and, and, you know, the more centralized you are, potentially the faster you can be, you know, the lower latency, more transactions per second, so forth, right? Um, and, and you see this, right? A lot of the public blockchains have very, very slow transaction speeds, right? I mean, how many transactions can you get in Bitcoin, right? Something like 10 a second, it's, it's, not, it's not very fast. Um, so so the, the sort of point in this is that, you know, we don't believe that there's going to be any single distributed ledger or, or even database that, that fits everyone's applications, right? You know, you might need to be more decentralized. Uh, you, you might need extra features like zero knowledge proofs or, or other privacy preserving properties. Um, so we're going to have a lot of, you know, today we have a lot of databases, you know, that, that even need to talk to each other. Um, but we can imagine a world where we have a lot of ledgers that need to talk to each other and, and communicate, uh, you know, swap assets, do atomic swaps, all this stuff. And, and how do we do this, right? This, this is pretty tricky these days. Uh, and th this is one of the problems that this, this Cactus project aims to solve, and it works with essentially all of our distributed ledgers on this. This is the same with Hyperledger Firefly, which sort of takes a little bit uh, different angle on interoperability and integration, where it's sort of, uh, I almost want to call it a container for blockchain or distributed ledgers, where you sort of write code once and you can run it on a bunch of different platforms. Um, so, so I guess in summary, I'll, I'll go back to your original question and pop the stack back up to that and say that, you know, uh, it's complicated saying what projects work with what other project. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I mean, I was just looking at the whole panoply there. And uh, as I say, it's it's all the trademark safe names. And I have no idea. The only way I can find out what they are is by clicking through and reading all about them. Uh, you've, with the, the, the video, people can see the picture on the screen there now. Uh, and yeah. uh, 
that, that, that that's also been a little bit of my experience of blockchain is that people are wildly enthusiastic about individual technologies. Uh, I I always had the impression at the beginning of Hyperledger Foundation that all of your initial stakeholders all contributed incompatible blockchain uh, toolkits from their labs into Hyperledger, and your early years were spent triaging the complete differences between all of those stacks. And this looks even more so now. This looks like you've got. You know, uh, you've got nine uh, projects that look like they're probably um, high ledgers, and you've got like six we have four ledgers that look like they're add-ons. Okay, we have another view that I that I believe is called the greenhouse view um, that mm -hmm. that lets you see this a little better. Um, but uh, well, I guess it depends on. I guess we'll, we'll say. Uh, Five ledgers, if if we're counting Indy, but Indy Indy is a very specialized ledger. Uh, it's you wouldn't want to use it for a non-identity purpose. Um, we have Fabric, which you know, um, or probably know. Uh, we have mm -hmm. Besu, which is Ethereum Ethereum execution client. Uh, we have Sawtooth, uh, which was contributed by uh, Intel. Uh, we have Aroha, which was contributed by Soramitsu and sort of has a, a mobile application focus. Uh, and we have Indy. Um, so, so those are the ledgers. Uh, we haven't had any new ledgers joined in quite some time. Uh, mm -hmm. so that has been, you know, uh, we've, we've sort of had efforts coalesce around the existing ledgers, um, which, which, you know, I, I think has been good. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> There's clearly some number of ledgers that's too much. Uh, and, <laughs> and depending on who you are, uh, that, that number can, can vary widely, um, but, you know, yeah, we're excited to see the proliferation of, of other stuff, uh, which are tools around making blockchain easier to run, making, you know, and I use blockchain here interchangeably with distributed ledger, uh, and, you know, making distributed ledgers easier to uh, to integrate, to operate, you know, j just streamlining processes. You know, um, we'd like to see stuff, you know, we're, we're seeing more stuff on uh, privacy preserving tools, uh, which is really important for distributed ledgers. And I know that's that's something that, that we haven't talked about, uh, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, um, we were talking about public blockchains, you know, one of my personal biggest concerns about public blockchains uh, that, you know, that you didn't really get to even is about uh, privacy, confidentiality, and anonymity. Uh, and if you want to work on those, you know, you, you do need really powerful tools like you know, snarks and zero, all kinds of zero knowledge proof stuff. And even then you have issues with uh, traffic analysis and other stuff. So I, um, boy, I have, this raises a whole lot of questions, starting with, starting with privacy. Um, but uh, first I have to let everybody know about Club Twit. So I'm getting our, our promo for that, joining Club Twit is another great way to support uh, the Twit Network. As a member, you get access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, as well as other great benefits. There's a bonus Twit Plus feed. That includes uh, footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit, as well as bonus shows we've started, such as the Giz Fizz and Ask Me Anything and Fireside Chats with some of your favorite Twit guests and co-hosts. As Floss Weekly listeners, you may be interested in checking out the untitled Linux show. That show is available only to Club Twit members. Um, and that is a great show that uh, Jonathan Bennett hosts, another one of my co-hosts here. And he does a great job. Um, so join up, join up, sign up, join up, same thing, Club Twit for just $7 a month. Head over to twit.tv slash Club Twit and join today. And we thank you for your, uh, for your support, for supporting us that way. So on and privacy, actually, you, you broke out privacy, confidentiality, and anonymity, which, you know, these are overlapping things. And anonymity is pretty well understood. Confidentiality is a matter of trust. You were talking about that at the beginning of the show. Um, privacy is kind of an outcome of a number of technologies. Technology is, 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 is a topic kind of near and dear to my heart because I've been focusing on it for a long time. Even wrote or co-wrote a manifesto on it. Um, that really starts with it's personal, um, and people need control over it. And we have privacy technologies in the physical world. Like I'm wearing clothes right now. We're all wearing clothes. Those are privacy technologies. They not only guard things we call our privates and other stuff we'd rather people not see, 
um, but also signal, you know, um, you're not supposed to plant a tracking beacon on me because I'm wearing something, right? And yet online, we haven't worked out privacy yet. In fact, privacy is is largely violated almost in a pro forma way. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if you're, if you visit that at all, I mean, it, it, what your approaches are to privacy with, with, um, with Hyperledger in general and with different projects in particular. Yeah. I mean, this is a topic near and dear to my heart as well. And, you know, I, I could go on for, for hours on this, um, you know, on digital privacy, you know, as we are moving things to to the web, you know, this isn't just a, a distributed ledger or a blockchain question. It's, it's a more general question. Um, but, you know, the the analogs of, of sort of real world privacy are scary, right? So, you know, the classic example of, of identity, obviously, is, is presenting your driver's license at a bar to show you're 21, right? Um, you know, You've seen this a million times, and and anyone who's who's touched digital identity has come across this. Um, so, in the real world, right? You know, the bartender or the bouncer, the doorman or whatever, looks at your ID, you know, scans it, makes sure okay, and and gives it back to you, right? And you know, <laughs> the digital analog of what's happening is this guy is is photocopying your driver's license, right, and then selling it to everyone he can. Uh, you know, and, and this is sort of concerning, um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, as, as as more and more of our lives go online, you know, more and more of our information goes online and this gets tracked in ways that, you know, that people don't realize or, or can't control. And obviously this goes back to the core of, of self-sovereign identity, right, is that, you know, you should, you should control your identity, uh, you should control your data. Um, but again, the, the, the question is how, and, and the question is, you know, can we put this in terms that are sort of, you know, easily understanding for, for people, right? Um, one of the, the complicating things is, is if you have a system, you know, like a distributed ledger or an identity system or whatever, um, how do you even define privacy for that system, right? Even the anonymity can be, can be tricky to define, right? Um, you know, and lots of people, uh, you know, use sort of what I call the uh, the patches O'Houlihan strategy for for privacy. I don't know if you've seen the movie Dodgeball, uh, but you know, this is basically just you know they just throw some tools, throw some cryptographic tools at, at the problem, and, and just sort of uh, hope it works. Um, but you know, if, if you really want to to say a system has privacy, you, you need to formally say what privacy means right um, and you need to have a, a definition that that makes sense um, I, I hope this is is making sense to you all yeah um there's a is it two, uh, two, two things one is i've uh, uh i've loved the idea of self-sovereign identity from the start um just by the name of it which a number of companies feel uncomfortable with but i um to be the internet as a it essentially a peer to peer system at the bottom level um, uh, basically promises everybody full agency <laughs> and if they want it or something close to full agency. And yet we've built lots and lots of very large companies that can do what only very large companies can do. And, and we need those. And then it, if you told me in 1995 that in 2022, we would still be using logins and passwords. I think you're crazy. Um, and yet here we are. Um, I mean, some things are, are miracles on the orders of loaves and fish. And on the other, there's, um, uh, you know, some things never change. And um, I, I wanted to mention somebody. I just, I, I just talked to somebody yesterday. This is actually, I'm not sure it's a blockchain project. It's a tide.org. They're in Australia. And they have a way to get rid of passwords basically by, having individuals um when they participate in a system their password is sharded out to many uh many different points in a distributed not a distributed ledger but in a distributed database so no one part of that database or many databases knows the whole password uh, which it's an approach to getting rid of passwords that i i found really interesting and 
and they it's not exactly a blockchain because there's not one one ledger across which everything is replicated it's there are many different nodes that are doing different things but the what i like about it is that it it attacks that problem and it starts with privacy as a as a need mm-hmm. but it's still a b2b thing and the thing that that i'm look at, that i've wanted i'd like to shift if we can to wallets because wallets have interested me since Google and Apple and others brought it up like 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know, but I, I, the, the wallet I have in my pocket is my wallet. It's not a Google wallet. It's not an Apple wallet. It, it's a place where I keep verifiable credentials. They, they reveal more about me than I'd like. If somebody wants to know that I'm over 18, they don't need to know where I live or what color my hair was <laughs> you know, when I had it. Um, but, um, and that's one of the promises of, of SSI is that we don't have to disclose everything. There's what Kim Cameron uh, of Microsoft, you know, with his seven laws of identity called minimum disclosure for constrained use and justifiable parties and plurality of operators and individual control over consent. Um, and and I see us moving in that direction. But part of what I'm looking for from you is some... Um, assurance, maybe some detail on how, on the one hand, um, doing what the Linux Foundation does, I think, extremely well, which is bring a bunch of big companies and big developers and um, happening things together, kind of into one room or under one umbrella and have them get, not so much get along, but work together on something that they all need and they're not going to compete on and then compete on gravy, whatever the gravy is. On the one hand, and on the other hand, have the individual represented in here somewhere. So that self-sovereign entity is actually a primary actor and not a secondary one. That'll make sense as a bit of a filibuster. Sorry. No, absolutely. Like that's, uh, you know, self-sovereign identity, verifiable credentials and anonymous credentials are a huge part of this, uh, upcoming open wallet project. So for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, there's a big effort going on right now at the Linux Foundation to, to start a new uh, open wallet project. Uh, you know, there's there's a ton of stuff online if you're interested, uh, but, you know, giving users agency and, uh, you know, self-sovereign identity are a big, big design principle of this wallet. And what you described earlier, which is the, uh, the key sharding, uh, the, you know, that's also in scope. And while we aren't, you know, far enough to have like an architecture or a roadmap, uh, this kind of thing, which is is usually called an MPC wallet, for lack of a better word, uh, because it usually uses uh, MPC, which is multi-party computation, uh, or some kind of threshold cryptography, to uh, to do this this key sharding and, and key recovery. Uh, you know, those are all things that people are interested in seeing. Um, so, you know, uh, I think. People are, are people will recognize the the desire and, and the need for these things, uh, and, and you know, I think the wallets of the future will have these. So, uh, you, you're, you, did you breathe hard there? <laughs> Simon? I, did, I did, I did. You know, uh, so <laughs> I, again, I, I, I'm watching all this, and I saw Open Wallet when it was announced. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that um, we didn't listen to Simpson Garfinkel when when he wrote Database Nation, uh, what seems like yesterday to me, but actually was really quite a long time ago, where he, really he pointed out that centralization without regulation leads to a loss of privacy. And mm-hmm. um, it, it seems to me that um, Open Wallet Foundation is very likely to, need, to lead to uh, a multiplicity of centralized wallets owned by brands facing towards consumers rather than toward to a technology that it will allow me as an individual to control my relationship with brands. Uh, am, am I misunderstanding this or, or is that really what's going on? So I, yeah, I, I think if people build a wallet that, that support, like I as a company, right, can build a wallet that, that supports self-sovereign identity, that supports verifiable credentials, that supports anonymous credentials, that still lets you, you know, control your identity and, and control what you disclose, right? You know, um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of companies and a lot of people recognize the merit of, of a neutral wallet, right? You know, and that if there is if there is a neutral wallet or, or a neutral wallet backbone, shall we say, 
that, you know, people, particularly privacy conscious people, will gravitate towards that. You know, so I, I, I'm not sure I entirely see how, uh, you know, um, how an open wallet would contribute to, to centralization. And I think, honestly, in the wallet space, uh, at least in the digital wallet space, you know, centralization really can't get any worse. Uh, the, the space is already extremely centralized. Um, you know, Apple Pay has just an enormous market share. Um, and, and, you know, outside of that, the, the Google Wallet and the, the Google Pay, you know, between those two, they, you know, they, they pretty much have the market cornered. Um, I, what, I, what I don't get here is, um, is really what's going to create that neutral wallet. Because uh, what I, I'm expecting Open Wallet Foundation to do is to create uh, a, a toolbox, a set of parts like mm-hmm. Hyperledger Foundation has done that other people will then build applications with. And the other people who will build those applications will undoubtedly be brands. And what we will see is a multiplicity of brands with... Uh, interoperable systems to the extent that it satisfies their business needs still being used from a point of control in facing consumers rather than something which is going to empower me to pick and choose between uh, all brands that I'm going to use, uh, which is an outcome that could only come about if it was either achieved through regulation or through a very powerful centralized charity. Uh, um, so I, again, you know, what am I missing here? It looks like it's going to build a toolkit. It doesn't look like it's going to build a wallet for me to control the brands with. It, it is going to build a toolkit. Um, I'm not. I, I guess you know, regulation is already heavily in play, uh, particularly you know European regulation, uh, which is you know as, as you're aware much stronger than than U.S. regulation. Um, you know, and, and I don't think you know you're not going to want a different wallet. For, for every brand, right? That's that's going to be massively inconvenient. That's not how it works today in, in either the, the real world or the digital world. Uh, so, you know, uh, the hope is that, you know, the market will, will steer us towards this, this sort of like, you know, neutral wallet uh, that does enable, you know, privacy preserving consumer functionalities. Uh, you know, that, that's what we expect. Uh, you know, so um, d- does does that make sense? Um, you know, I, I'm I'm much, I'm being being a, a British cynic rather than a, 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 <laughs> I a, get a, that. a rather than a hopeful American. Um, I, you know, I I look at this and what I see happening is the toolkit being used by a family of brands to build interoperable wallets, uh, but they'll still want they'll want me to have their. Uh, their brand wallet on my phone so that I tend to shop with them so that I tend to share credentials with them and they'll want to use the interoperability that uh, Open Wallet Foundation gives them in order to have favoured relationships with their partners. Uh, but none of this is going to be designed so that, uh, it's in, that, that it's in my interests. It will all be designed in the interests of the brands. And the only way you can avoid that is if Open Wallet Foundation instead builds an open wallet that all of its member companies then uh, choose to make their systems compatible with. And if that was what you were proposing, I'd be really quite excited about it. But it sounds very much like the world I'm going to see is the first world. Uh, so I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, you know, again, we, you know, in the open source community, you know, we can sort of only get the software out there and, and hope the best things happen. You know, we can't control... Uh, who uses the software, you know, necessarily for, for what purposes, you know, a lot of the companies that I have talked to about this, you know, do want to respect privacy. They, they do want to do it right. You know, there are regulations that, uh, you know, that handle, you know, particularly in Europe, uh, a lot of the, the privacy issues and things around that. And, you know, not every people just don't want a multitude of wallets, right? People want to use one wallet. They want to use it seamlessly. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that I really see this like proliferation of, of wallets happening. You know, I think, you know, there may be, you know, so, some collection of wallets, but at the end of the day, in the real world, I have one wallet, right? And I, I presumably want to have one digital wallet too, right? Um, and then if grants want to participate, you know, we can, 
you know, they can give me credentials, I can give them credentials, right? Uh, but but I would hope it would be through this one wallet and not through this prol- proliferation of wallets. Uh, are you so, going to make a, a reference implementation of uh, of a, an open wallet that uh, maybe c- might be the seed for a a, 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 a citizen centric rather than a brand centric tool? Uh, people definitely will. Yeah, um, I don't know that we will have you know an official Linux foundation or an official open wallet. Uh, you know. Well, uh, reference implementation, but you know, uh, you know, like people like the government of British Columbia are involved in this project, and I highly doubt that you know they're going to to put something together that's, uh, you know, that's not consumer or citizen friendly, right? Um, yeah. Uh, um, a, a couple of things. One, one is uh, I wanted. To, I'm glad you brought up British Columbia because that. I think is one of the blockchain success stories anyway, that they're using blockchain in, in their own identity uh, system. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's live. So, so, um, yeah, yeah, it's live. It's been there. It's been there for a while. Um, and um, uh, there's, but I want to, I want to stay on the wallet for, for a minute because I, I want to know what it looks like and what's in it because um, is it something that is a, a, you know, something I could click on the, on the front page of my, of my phone. Um, is it something that's just invisible and it's just basically, I have a database that I just know and it just gets used and, and it just be, it's as, as ver as I issue verif in other words, as I, I, I go to the, sh- I go to the show, I have bought a ticket, I, I, I carry a verifiable credential. I wave my phone in front of something or there's a QR code involved or there's just a verifiable credential in a, in a verifiable credential scenario. And that happens. But there's there's one question about that, which is what it looks like and feels like, so we know what we're talking about. The the other is what else goes in there? Um, because my fantasy is I have a lot of data about myself that's not just a verifiable credential issued to me, say by my school that I went to, or by the credit card company, or or the or the drivers or the you know uh, the DMV or the government in some way, but I also have like all my health records, all my financial information, all my possessions, um, where I might wish, for example, to disclose to an insurance company what some of my possessions are. That's my, my internet of things. Um, and I'm wondering if those kind of things are imagined as among the forms of data that pass through a wallet, that it's not just, I deal only in transactions, but rather something more, rich and complicated than that yeah so you asked a lot of questions there yeah um, i'm sorry so, <laughs> no no worries it's totally fine so you know this is this is a very early effort right so we don't know exactly uh what the final shape will be right you know we haven't officially formed the project yet we just have a a co- you know like uh a group discussing the the formation if if you will um so sort of questions about that, like what, what's the final shape and, and all that, you know, uh, this is, this is not yet determined. Um, so, so I can't give you a great answer on that. Um, as far as the other data goes, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's in scope with this, right? People want to be able to do, uh, I guess I'll call it records if you will. Uh, you know, so, uh, Obviously, things like education credentials, but but this would also presumably include uh, medical records, right? Um, you know, and, and those are particularly interesting, right? Because you know, under normal st- circ- you have to be sort of careful, right? Because under normal circumstances, you should absolutely have control over those records. Uh, but if you're in you know an emergency room situation, you may want someone else to be able to override that, right? Uh, so, but yes, I, I think, you know, while I can't say for certain, uh, certainly this, this general like nebulous area of important personal records would, would be in scope. Yeah. I, well, that's, uh, that's encouraging. Actually, um, uh, I, I want to get into crypto a little bit before the end of the show, but, um, sure. Simon, I think you had one more, one more question about the foundation itself and what it might do. 
Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I don't know if it's a question or not, uh, Hart, but would that would the Open Wallet Foundation consider being a an independent five hundred one c three public charity rather than a trade association? Because it seems to me that many of these questions we're talking about about uh, serving the public before serving the brands comes down to having an entity that is designed to serve the public instead of serving the brands. Well, the Open Wallet would be under the Linux Foundation, so technically it would be under a charity. Uh, yeah, but Linux qualify. Foundation isn't a charity; it's a trade association. It's a five hundred one c six. Sure. Um, so you're asking, uh, you know. I think it's an interesting question, you know, if you could put together, you know, a, a charity to, to implement, uh, you know, a, a fully, uh, you know, a fully consumer focused, you know, privacy preserving open wallet, um, you know, but I think that, you know, I think there are a lot of people that are going to work on this and do this, right? Like, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I would trust like what the government of British Columbia would put out, for instance. Right. Um, you know, so so I don't know if, if that will happen, uh, but I do think there are certainly, you know, parties involved, you know, in uh, in this, you know, that, that, that would uh, would put out something that would be consumer focused. So. Um, yeah, um, and I think we've, <laughs> I, I once went on about something and the, the guy I was talking to says, well, I think you've nailed that one to the floor, Doc. And so <laughs> I think we've, we've covered the, the wallet question pretty well. I'd like to ask a crypto question because you're, you know, you're a degreed sure, yeah. and uh, respected authority on it. And it's a, it's a simple question, which is, can people really finally, I mean, it, will people understand it? I mean, because as soon as you get into key pairs and public and private keys and PKI and how all that works, people not only tend to glaze, but people in the long run, they learn a QWERTY keyboard. Um, they know what internal combustion is. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's some fairly complicated things that everybody can understand to some degree. People learn to drive. That's a really complicated thing to do uh, or to ride a bike. So can people understand crypto? Because Can crypto be something where, there's common knowledge about how this works, or is it always going to remain the domain of of of, of weenies like us? <laughs> I don't know. Well, we I think it's. That. I think it's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, you know, at at a high level, I think it's definitely possible. And you know, I think every you know software engineer should understand how it works at a high level. More importantly, what are the common primitives? What guarantees do they give? Uh, and how do things work, right? You know, for a digital signature algorithm, for instance, right? It's a tuple of three algorithms, right? You have a key generation algorithm, you have a, a signing algorithm, and you have a verification algorithm, right? And the idea is, you know, if you have the verification key, you can verify standard or signatures, right? If you have the signing key, you can sign. And if you have the verification key, but not the signing key, you shouldn't be able to forge signatures even if you've seen existing signatures, right? Um, you know, and then that's the high level understanding of the primitive, but, but that's that's basically it to a di digital signature, right? If I give you a digital signature API, you just need to know that. You don't need to understand, uh, you know, how the math works or, or anything like that, right? Um, so, you know, understanding some of the math behind uh, behind some of these cryptographic primitives can be quite complicated. Uh, like pairings are, are mathematically challenging. Uh, some of the newest post-quantum cryptographic primitives like elliptic curve isogenies are also quite challenging. But, you know, the good thing is you don't necessarily need to understand that to use cryptography, right? Um, you know, and, and we just hope that people can learn enough to use cryptography, uh, you know, it's not important for everyone to understand the math behind cryptography, but it is important for people to understand the primitives and what they mean and sort of what they give you. Uh, I hope that's clear. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, did you want to ask the question you just put in, in the uh, chat I will. there? 
Um, yeah. So, yeah, Good one. semi-seriously, Hart, what should we call crypto cryptography now that cryptocurrency has stolen the abbreviation crypto? Uh, much I still my call it grief. I still call it crypto. I mean, if you, you know, there people at the academic cryptography conferences still print out shirts saying that crypto means cryptography. Um, <laughs> so, crypto. When you say crypto to me, it means the you know. The, the big academic conference hosted in Santa Barbara annually. I still refer to right. cryptocurrency as cryptocurrency. Um, so so maybe I'm not the right person to ask because I'm <laughs> one of the last remaining holdouts on this. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, so you know, welcome to the welcome to the uh, legion of the elderly with Doc and I. Um, uh, the, this is this is a, an eternal challenge when somebody steals the word that you use to describe yourself to instead describe something that you're not very fond of. Um, uh, but I, I actually think this is a serious problem for the public understanding of science, because when you say crypto, I know that what you mean is cryptography, and I know that what you've got to say is of deep worth and highly educated. Um, when a newspaper hears you say crypto, they're thinking Bitcoin. And uh, bringing public understanding to science has got to be harmed by that. It I, I'll, we're getting toward the end of the show, and I, I, I just need to jump in on, on this one, which is we've had this problem with hackers for yes. 40 years. <laughs> you know, I mean, on the one hand, it's a, it's a badge of honor for those who call themselves that. There's a big fat dictionary um, of, of terms that they use, and at the same time, uh, it means bad guys. And it, I, I don't think we'll ever solve it, actually. I think that's, uh, you know, that's a tough one. But it, anyway, this is... This has been a great show, and and I'm sorry we're that hour went very fast, even without ads in it. Um, so, so it, are there any questions we haven't asked yet? We, you can ask answer briefly before we finish, Hart. I think you you all have done a great job of of asking <laughs> questions. Uh, so, you know, I've appreciated them. Uh, great, thank you, thank you very much. It's been great having you on the show. There are two more before we go. What are your um, favorite? Um, Text text editors and and scripting language. Um, well, for what I guess is the this is the question. Um, oh, I used it can, it, any answer is fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can qualify to do what you want. Because uh, yeah, I use very different things to write like papers than I do to write code. Um, you know, I've always been someone who uses uh, Emacs to write code. Uh, my like LaTeX editor has changed many, many times over the years, and it almost always changes as soon as I get a new computer. Um, I think I'm using yeah, some some kind of tech shop right now. Uh, and so what was the other question? Oh, uh, 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 scripting language. Uh, scripting language? Uh, does Bash count? Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. well, that'll be my answer. We've had Brian Fox on here talking about that as himself, dude, yeah. who, who created Bash. So that's great. I appreciate it a lot. It's been been great having you on the show. Love to have you back, especially to, you know, since Hyperledger's changed as much as it has in the last several years, it'll change some more. So it'd be great to hear from you again. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for your time. And thank you too. So Simon... Dude, you were you were strong there. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, Hart I, did a, I didn't I, mean to bring you on for that reason, but you know, you're, you know, always has tough ones. Well, you, you know me and crypto, Doc. I mean, um, I didn't that well. Now I do. <laughs> <laughs> now you do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, Hart has been has been a a, a great uh, uh, interviewee. There, he's been um, uh, very uh, tolerant of uh, some tough questions. Um, I, you know, I do think we find ourselves. Uh, at a juncture where we should be asking whether a charity should be doing the work that Linux Foundation has has picked for Open Wallet Foundation, uh, because we can't rely on uh, adequate uh, citizen-centered regulation arriving in time. And so the antidote for that is to have an organization whose mission is to serve the general public rather than to serve its paying members. And uh, it seems to me that there's a very much a need for uh, a 501c3 or what I call a public charity to be 
uh, doing some of this privacy-centric work, and if it could do it under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation so that its work is respected by those Linux Foundation members, we may well be able to head off the crisis of privacy that I think will arise from um, having things sufficiently anonymous that governments can't apply regulation, uh, which strikes me actually as the worst of all possible worlds where we have a centralizable technology through aggregated power that is sufficiently cryptographically anonymous that governments can't regulate it. That sounds terrible to me. So I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the question I would love to ask is about the C3. Uh, and I, I understand half yeah. can't answer that. But I think that's the, the question that's left on the table from this discussion for me. Well, I, I, I look at this in a more evolutionary way. I think that the Linux Foundation was a I think a brilliant move is I think they need, there needed to be a trade association there. I don't think of them so much as a trade association, but they certainly qualify because, you know, big companies pay to belong. Um, but there does, there does need to be a big tent where large entities that can afford a lot of developers and are doing, and, and you know, work on which that's responsible for a lot of what we do in the world um, can gather and, and work on open source stuff uh, that, that they share. I think there's a, a hole exactly where you say, which is on the customer side, on the individual side, the consumer side. And um, that's why we started customer comments, which is a 501 C three years ago. It is completely funding free. <laughs> so, and if the Linux Foundation <laughs> wants to talk to us about that, that'd be great. I, I wouldn't mind being under that umbrella if that fits. I don't know if 501 C threes fit under that, but um, we have another example of a case where that worked out. Not that there were any big companies involved in creating it with uh, Creative Commons, um, with copyright. It's a very limited scope of, of what they're responsible for, but they created uh, a way for anybody that does any kind of art to have some control over their copyright. And that has created, that changed the world in a, in a lot of positive ways. So, um, so I, do see some, I do see some hope there. I think it's early. I think it's early, and I, and I do hear heart on, on the sincere efforts that are going on um, within Hyperledger to, or in the wallet thing as well. I I think any developer working on a wallet is going to feel his back pocket and say, "I want to work for this, and not, and not just for you know whatever whatever large employer you know they might be they might be working for at the time, and uh, yep. and who stays forever with any one large employer anymore either. So that's another you know, if not a saving grace, at least a, a grace of some kind. <laughs> so I think there's lots to talk about still here, Doc. You know, oh, yeah, the, always the, is. And again, curiously, you know, this is blockchain we're talking about, and here's me saying we need to talk about it some more. Um, uh, there you go. So uh, we, we need to have maybe maybe get a round table together where it's there are some different voices who can argue it out without weapons. Well, that's that might be better, and, and you know, maybe we can assemble one here, you know. Um, yeah. That's a possibility too, and so I, I just thought of something I could promote for that. But go ahead. What what do you want to plug before we get off? You know, I'm promotion free this week. Uh, I I don't have anything that I want to plug. <laughs> Uh, the for the people on video, just follow me on Twitter and on. If you actually, I'd love to see a whole load of people following me on act, on the Activity Pub Federation. So that's Mastodon, Pleroma, Plume, all of those, where I am. Um, uh, my my. Uh, Mastodon website is meshed.cloud and uh, I am at webmink on meshed.cloud. I would love to have a whole load of listeners and, and uh, viewers here joining me on Mastodon and uh, the, the quality of the conversation is somehow much better on ActivityPub than it is on Twitter. So uh, come find me on there. Yeah, okay. Well, then, and after the next couple of days, I think the 30th is when Elon Musk does or does not buy Twitter and, um, and Twitter may... There may be a rush to your to your small tent there uh, uh, before, <laughs> before that happens. Uh, uh, speaking of round tables, um, uh, the Internet Identity Workshop. Um, look it up. Uh, it, the short link is iiworkshop.org. Happens twice a year. The whole SSI thing that we talked about came out of that. Pretty much everything I know about what Hyperledger is doing <laughs> it's, is is actually through sessions that we have. It's an unconference. Um, it happens at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View in California in Silicon Valley. It happens twice a year. It's three full days of nothing but gatherings of people in breakouts. There are no keynotes. There are no um, uh, 
no um, panels or anything like that. It's just uh, sponsors buy food and uh, and projectors and things like that. They don't they don't run the show. So any, anyway, look it up iiworkshop.org um, and uh, and come there. This is exactly the kind of thing we like to talk about there. Uh, and uh, also coming up next week, we have Jeff Geerling on. He's at jeffgeerling.com, G-E-E-R-L-I-N-G. Uh, he was formerly with Acquia. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing right now. We'll find out a week from now. Until then, I'm Doc Searles. This has been Floss Weekly. We'll see you then. Hey, folks, I'm Ant Pruitt. And what do you get your favorite tech geek that has everything? A club twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With the Club Twit subscription, they get access to all of our podcasts ad free. They also get access to our members only discord, access to exclusive outtakes behind the scenes and special content such as AMAs, which I just love hosting, plus exclusive shows such as Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows and the Untitled Linux show. Purchase your geek's gift at twit.tv slash club twit, and it will thank you every day.